Welcome to the Vintage Gun Journal and the first of our series called Interview with the Gunmaker. I'm Diggory Hader and our guest today is a man who made a name for himself in the gun trade in a very short space of time when elevated to a senior position at the tender age of 24. Today he runs one of London's most prolific gun makers, a firm that has won prizes and broken numerous sales records during his tenure. I'm sure viewers will find his story fascinating and his insights into the modern gun trade enlightening. So please welcome to Interview with the Gunmaker, the Managing Director of John Rigby and Company, Mark Newton. Mark, welcome and thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to talk to us. Well, th thank you very much for, for having me along. I feel, uh, feel slightly embarrassed after such a fabulous intro there. <laughs> <laughs> I did get that right, didn't I? You were 24 when you got this gig. T technically, I was 25, but 24 makes it sound better. <laughs> <laughs> 25 is still pretty impressive. Now, what I want to try and do here with this series is get under the skin of the people that are at the heart of the, the, the UK gun trade, because um, you know, in, in the past, people like Teasdale Buckle wrote books like Experts on Guns and Shooting, and they form a fantastic record of the people who were at the heart of the uh, gun trade back in the 1880s. And I think, um, I think that sort of record is just as valuable to get as a snapshot of where the trade is now. And there are lots of fascinating people doing amazing work. And, um, and it's, it's going to be fantastic for enthusiasts, for Rigby and other guns, in, in British guns in particular, to get insights into who these people are and what you're all doing. So if we can start with something that uh, comes right back to the beginning, where were you born? I was born in Chichester, West Sussex. Um, so, yeah, south coast, uh, born and born and bred Sussex lad. And what was your childhood like? What kind of boy were you? <laughs> um, it was interesting. I mean, like sort of so many people these days, you know, came from a sort of broken broken home. So, um, childhood was spent sort of half half the time with with mum, uh, living more of a a sort of towny lifestyle and half the time living with our father who was uh, you know, a gamekeeper, uh, granddad was a gamekeeper so it was very much um, you know in the blood and in, in the family um, and I suppose uh, like sort of most boys growing up in, in that setting my elder brother and I we were uh, complete fanatics um, sort of uh, growing up semi-feral uh, air guns, pocket knives, um, you know, building pheasant pens, you name it, you know, in this sort of expansive garden that we had. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. A lot of, absolutely, absolutely a lot of fun. Very similar to me. Um, so um, when, uh, when did your interest in guns and shooting begin? Can you remember your first gun and what, what sort of exploits you had with it? <sighs> Do you know, I can't remember a time where, where, where it was just so, I think just sort of from when we were born and even before then, I think, you know, I was sort of probably conceived in a, in a high seat somewhere out in the Sussex countryside. I don't remember a time in my life where, where shooting and guns uh, were, not, uh, were not a big part of our lives. Um, you know, shooting uh, with an air rifle, uh, you know, growing up and, and then moving on to a, and to a shotgun, you know, and, and, and eventually a rifle. Um, but it was, you know, dad, dad, dad was and is a sort of very old school Edwardian type chap. And um, it meant that we didn't really sort of go to the beach and the circus and the zoo and other things. We sort of just went out sort of shooting, hunting, fishing. And we were completely indoctrinated from, you know, from, from an earliest memory. Um, it, it's, all, it's all we did. And, we, you know, we, we absolutely loved it. And how did he teach you about gun safety and ha firearms handling? Was that done formally or was it something that was done almost by osmosis because you spent so much time together? A, a lot of it was osmosis, but there are still uh, aspects of the formal education which really uh, have stuck with me. Um, I can remember being allowed to fire a shotgun for the first time uh, on, a, on a pheasant shoot. So we would, you know, in the, in the years leading up to it, I was allowed to carry the gun empty between drives, for example. So we'd move from one drive to the next and I would carry the gun for my father. Um, and then the first time I was ever allowed to actually have a shot, I was given one cartridge. Um, so, you know, you knew you had to make it count. Um, and uh, my father describing, um, the process of getting to a peg and I still do this to this day and I still teach this to people 
who are shooting with me for the first time. I get to the peg and uh, first of all, I look to who my neighbours are, put my hand up so everyone knows where everyone is. And then I assess my piece of sky and mark that out. And anything that goes into that piece of sky, if it's safe and it gives me pleasure to, to shoot, then I will, you know, shoot at it. Maybe not always hit it, but, uh, you know, and, th and that's very much stuck with me. And my father, I remember the first time, you know, doing this and he'd said, you see that man there? It was a, an old family friend who was shooting next to us. And you see that man there? There was another family friend. He said, if you point that gun anywhere near anyone here or do anything unsafe, you will never, ever shoot with me again. And it was I can remember being sort of quite frightened of the, of the whole of the whole thing, you know, so a mixture of excitement and quite frightened of this huge responsibility. Um, but it's it's lasted with me. And I think about it every time I get onto a peg and pull the, the gun out of the bag and, you know, stand there and wait. And it's um, you know, something that I'll teach my own children. And I think it probably six or seven goes over six or seven days of having one cartridge before I hit hit a bird. And it was again i'll never never forget that you know this hen bird came around the drive called poison corner and bang shot this thing and uh in my dad's face who as i said earlier was sort of very edwardian type chap and absolutely over the moon um and uh yeah very very special but it's you know it's important that we teach young people these things and uh you know and it lasts with you a lifetime it is yeah no that's that's great um so so young Mark was, um, was a, an avid shooting sportsman and um, had a good grounding and everything. So you knew what the um, end product uh, was going towards and what the sport involved. So tell me about your first job and your early career. How did you get into this? Well, I, um, I, I you know, like sort of a lot of other sort of kids, you know, uh, didn't particularly excel at school. Uh, used to sort of bunk off to go beating and 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 fishing and, and these sorts of things, uh, deer stalking. Uh, and college was much the same. I think I, you know, didn't really have my sort of heart in it. But uh, I remember, I was about eighteen, and uh, I was working for Orvis, the fly fishing company, as their Saturday boy, um, which uh, which was a great uh, sort of uh, grounding in sales. Um, I was working there on Saturdays alongside a, a Saturday or a weekend job uh, at my father's pub restaurant, um, which gave, you know, gave me great sort of experience in interacting with the, the public. Um, and uh, all this had offered me a, 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 a job up in London as a, as a sort of um, sales assistant. So I'm 18 years old. Uh, I don't think I'd ever been to London before. Uh, shipped up on a train with, uh, with a suitcase and a few quid in my pocket. And that was, that was me out in the big wide world. And I was very lucky uh, that, I, that I met a man called Michael Cartledge, who many people I'm sure will know, who, was, who sadly was uh, killed uh, tragically uh, after a Christmas party at Beretta Gallery where he worked um, in, a, in a road accident. But, uh, you know, it was quite a lonely time living in London when I just moved up there. But I'm very lucky to have met him. And I would spend every lunchtime in the Beretta gallery with uh, John Hormerson, you know, I remember meeting him in there and sitting there talking about ticker rifles and Beretta shotguns and, you know, everything else in between. And um, it was, a, it was, uh, I don't know, about a year into that, of nine, nine, 10 months into that, that Michael would said, had I ever heard of Rigby's? I said, of course. You know, I grew up reading books and we used to have this uh, Webley and Scott 410 bolt action uh, which I used to pretend was my 416 when I was about sort of 12 years old. Um, and, and, you know, it's a great imagination. Um, and uh, I said, yeah, of course I've heard of them. He said, well, the man who, who used to own Rigby's, uh, Paul Roberts, is looking for a, a sort of apprentice to bring on to, to, to train up a bit of floor sweeping and packing and the sort of usual things that you'd start off doing in the trade. Would you be interested? And I said, of course. So, Ended up walking down to to seat Paul, which uh, I don't know if many people at home have, have been to the old Paul Roberts, uh, Jerry Robertson son shop in Wyville Road. It was uh, something of an Aladdin's cave. Uh, it built into an old sort of industrial unit. Um, and I turned up in a sort of 30 quid cheap suit and feeling well out of my depth. And David, the late David Marks opened the door and ushered me in. And I'll just never, more than anything, I'll never forget the smell of the, of the place, sort of Rangoon oil and you know, you know, all these old trinkets about the place, it's extraordinary. And I sat down and my job interview consisted of Paul Roberts walking in in a green Kynock lab coat. And he walked into the, uh, into this office and I was, was very nervous. And he, uh, he looked me up and down and, and he said, I, yeah, I think you'll do. And that, that was the interview. <laughs> and that's how I, that's how I ended up in the gun trade. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, um, so that was your introduction to Paul Roberts. And um, I'm assuming that Paul was one of the, uh, these important role models in your life. Um, tell me a little bit about working with Paul and some of the other people that you met while you were in that job. Well, it was a it was a fascinating place, and uh, you know you got you had Paul Roberts, John Restigini, and David Marks, who collectively had well over a hundred years of gun trade experience between them. And a company like Jay Roberts and Son, we used to see so many different guns coming through there, from you know, everything from a sort of Vical over and under to a to a Boss single trigger and everything in between. And it was a great opportunity to pick these things up and understand them there's a lot of them coming in for repair and servicing and storage so you know every day you were handling new things it was very very exciting um, and and the guys were very very generous with their knowledge you know i mean paul um you know i, I describe him as the sort of last of the 1960s playboys you know he's been there and, and done it and uh, had every sports car in between and uh, you know hunted all over the world but you know, Paul has in particular become something of a sort of second father to me. And uh, whilst we didn't always, uh, you know, like much of the same as a father-son relationship, it was, it was strained at times. Most of the time, you know, Paul was incredible with, um, with his knowledge giving. Um, and often I would find myself, you know, there a couple of hours after the shop was uh, closed and listening to Paul and, you know, learning, you know, things like the, the ideal centers between uh on a 416 double rifle you know the tiny things and writing this down on on the back of a pizza box or a scrap of paper and putting this away and sort of storing this all this information um it was an incredible incredible time and a lot of fun it was really actually it really wasn't a job it was more of a sort of a holiday camp with uh with a spice of gun making in there as well and uh you know it I worked my way up from you know, that sort of sweeping the floors and things to, to selling my first gun, which was a Winchester 12 bore built on a sort of a Browning action. And um, we, uh, yeah, you know, sort of for about 750 quid. And I don't think I'd ever seen so much money. I was, sort of, you know, over the, over the moon that I'd sold this. And, and you know, Paul, Paul was quite chuffed. And then all of a sudden, I'm, you know, selling a few other bits. And, and by the time I'd left there, you know, Paul and I were selling sort of most of the, most of the gear and the orders and overseeing a lot of those orders going through the workshop. So it was, uh, it was, a, had a lot of free reign to explore, uh, you know, explore, you know, the gun making art, which was great. Yeah, that's right. And um, it must've been a fantastic place for a young lad to be working. I mean, it's everybody, every gun nuts dream job, isn't it? To get somebody like Paul as a mentor and be in that sort of environment where all these weird and wonderful people who at the time you probably just thought of them as, you know, the odd American coming in and the odd chap coming in. And now you know that some of these people are some of the most important collectors and gun makers and uh, authorities on the subject in the world. And, and you've got to know them in a very um, natural sort of process. That must have uh, stood you in good stead for later on. Absolutely. And, and you know, it was... You know, I still speak to Paul sort of regularly now. And, you know, if I've got a question, he's, he's just such a generous guy with his knowledge. And, uh, you know, I really, sort of really hero worshipped him. And not, not just not just Paul, you know, John Restigini and the late David Marks as well. They were fascinating guys, you know. And, you know they hunted all over the world, had you know, bought out collections in India. You know, it, it's stuff that sort of, you know, the good old days, you know, uh, of, of collecting, gun making and hunting. And to, to spend time with them was... Um, it was, you know, looking back at it, I wasn't really sort of as aware of it as, as, at the time, but looking back now, at it now, it was very, very good for character building and, um, you know, for just sort of building that knowledge and, you know, meeting, you know, big collectors from, from around the world who'd come in and, you know, who were, you know, Paul is very, very dear friends with a lot of these people. And, you know, I, I don't overlook the fact that, you know, some of the, some of the, the great, uh, great support we receive here in our rigbies is is built off the back of that um that uh you know goodwill from from paul and you know it's you know he's you know paul's as much as what happens here now as ever really i suppose with rigbies yeah no that's very interesting now so you you then picked up um you picked up the the job at rigby um quite a lot of people know this story but if you wouldn't mind just briefly recapping it for us and bringing us up to up to date well, it, like uh, like my first job, I, I don't think, recall actually ever having a formal job interview because uh, Paul, uh, Paul and I, uh, working at Jay Robertson's son, had been approached by the most recent owners of um, 
Rigby's. Uh, so Rigby's, as most people know, was in California until about 2010, sort of entered all kinds of legal issues and was taken taken on by uh, t- two chaps from Dallas who really made a great effort in, in securing those uh, those trademarks and, the, and t- put, putting away those legal issues for, for good. Um, and uh, contacted Paul and asked if Paul could start producing a few guns in London again, which is how I met them. And, uh, you know, we so, you know, building a few Jeffries and a few Rigby's and a few Jay Robertson Sun guns. And we were, we were out at um, Safari Club in 2013 and uh, helping, out, helping out on the Rigby booth. And the, one of the chaps had said, we're, we're thinking of selling. And um, have you heard of Michael Luca? And I said, oh, from Watson Brothers. He said, no, 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 from, from Blazer. I said, well, no, I haven't, I haven't heard of this chap. He said, well, he's the man behind Blazer. Would you, would you like to, to meet him? I said, yeah, I'd be be great so uh, walked off the booth of this gentleman and we walked around and for half an hour or so and and he said you know you've got 10 minutes to tell me how you would uh, how you'd bring Rigby's back and you know I sort of very enthusiastically told him and, and essentially all I told him was what we've what we've actually done in the last seven and a half eight years um and uh he said yeah okay well the job's yours and we're going to do it so I kind of sort of came back to the booth feeling sort of having something of an out of body experience. So I was 25 and uh, I phoned my father and said, you'll never believe what's happened. And he said, well, tell me. So I sort of talked him through it. And I said, the problem is I have no idea how to start a company, how to run a company, what a P and L is, what a balance sheet, none of this. So, I mean, it was just, you know, but I had raw passion for gun making. And he said, you can learn all of that stuff, but you can't learn an opportunity like this. They're great words. And uh, the hardest thing I think I had to do was to talk to Paul, but again, Paul, you know, just an incredible human being. He was so, so supportive. And he said, you absolutely have to do this. You know, these opportunities just don't come along. Um, and bless his heart, he also let me rent his old gun shop because at the same time, he, you know, he was leaving London. And uh, we were able to move straight into a, into a facility in London and, um, you know, get going with, with bringing Rigby's back. And that, yeah, that, that is essentially how it happened. Just as, just as that happened, it was uh, exciting times. Very exciting. And again, looking back on it now, I mean, we, you know, so I sort of left Paul's. Paul was in the process of moving out. I was running Rigby's from the back of a 500 pound Ford Fiesta in Sainsbury's car park, uh, stealing Wi Fi usage uh, on a laptop I bought on a credit card that I couldn't afford. I mean, it was pretty, pretty basic uh, stuff. Um, but it snowballed. And, um, you know, like so many things in life, when something's supposed to happen, the, you know, like, like Rigby's coming back, the sort of planets aligned. And, you know, every time I needed something to sort of kind of happen, it just kind of happened. Um, and, you know, from, in, within a month, we were in Paul's shop and I borrowed as much furniture from family and friends as I could and painted, this, painted it up and put a sign over the door and hired a gun maker and then hired another gun maker and got Patty Pugh involved. We shouldn't overlook her massive involvement with helping bring back the company because, there was me, this 25-year-old kid who had a vision and passion, but had absolutely no idea how to implement it in a sort of corporate way. Um, and she came out of retirement and helped set the whole thing up with me. So she was something of a cuddle blanket or whatever you want to call it for those early couple of years. And until, a very steady uh, until, pair of hands there. Absolutely, absolutely. And it was, you know, and actually that sort of um, ethos has stayed with the company because we've, we've got quite a young team here. I mean, you've seen it yourself, Dick. There's probably... Um, uh, you know, average age is well under 30. Uh, but then we do have a few sort of silverbacks, uh, as I like to call them, uh, in, our, in, in and amongst the, the family. And um, sometimes, though, you know, young, young passion is needed to drive things forwards. And sometimes, you know, the silverbacks need to rein those guys in. And sometimes the younger guys need to push the silverbacks. And it sort of yeah, works very that, well. That brings me to a question I was going to ask a little bit later, but we've, we've touched on it now. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring that one in now. So you do employ a lot of young people. Um, how do you decide who's a good fit for rugby? And what do you tell them they can achieve in the gun trade if they make it a career? That's a great question. And I don't think, I don't think it's one I can easily answer. You just kind of get a feeling when you hire people. Um, you know, it is very unique here. I did an interview with Simon Byer saying we talked about, um, you know, Rigby's and the, and the team. And, and I said that the, the word team and family are completely overused in a corporate professional setting. But for Rigby, they, they almost don't go far enough. It is very, very much like a family here. Um, so it's difficult to 
uh, it's difficult to put into words this feeling you get from someone and the vibe. And I've always said, as I said yesterday, that anyone who's willing to leave their home country to give it a go at a, at a job, it says something about their character. And, um, you know, I've, you know, of course, I've made plenty of mistakes along the way and we've had to say goodbye to a few people. But the, the core of the team here are, are just sort of diehard Rigby through and through. And they, um, you know, there's just a feeling you get from someone and you know they're going to fit. And in terms of opportunity, I always say to these guys, seven and a half years ago, I was a shop assistant at Jay Robertson's son. And six, seven years before that, I was you know drop out from college and because of the opportunity i had with paul and now rigby's you know i'm you know managing director of of one of these great firms and you know there is opportunity if you if you work hard and you listen and you put the time in and you get a great deal of luck as well you know you who says you know who knows how far you can go in 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 the world so that's the uh, the kind of sort of feeling and and what i what i sort of try and tell the younger guys joining here and you know some of these guys have joined as apprentices five six years ago and they're now sort of helping run the factory so it's um you know it's it's all about bringing people up yeah it's great to see the english gun trade still bringing people through in that way because um, that's the future you know it's a cliche to say it but um, for such a long time, trade seemed to be in stagnation, but firms like Rigby doing what you're doing now, it feels really quite vibrant. But you, you're also bringing in what you call the silverbacks, the chaps who've been, a, been around. And um, I once got into trouble for saying that the gun trade was notoriously incestuous, but uh, I'll stand by that statement because we do see lots of bed hopping, for want of a better word. You've, you've been around and you've pulled in some really experienced, interesting people to help you with the projects. Tell me about some of them. Well, it started with, you know, Patty Pugh, who was financial director at Rigby's for, for all those years. And she, uh, you know, she, she, she really sort of laid the foundations for the Rigby's that you see now um, and was a massive part of that. Um, Ed Workman, uh, from, who, who, who ran the, the Purdy and the Holland factories, um, who has perhaps the best little black book uh, in the entire industry in terms of engravers and outworkers and these things um, and carries a tremendous amount of respect for these people because he stands by his word. If he promises you a job on a certain date, it's going to turn up on that date. And again, we couldn't do what we do here without him. Uh, Mark Remnant, who was with Paul Roberts for so many years at Rigby's, it's lovely to have one of the original Rigby uh, craftsmen in the, I, mean, I get told awful, uh, regularly for not for saying the original Rigby's. This is also original Rigby's because of course it's Rigby's, but uh, you know perhaps the, the Rigby's of yesteryear. It's lovely to have someone like Mark involved and hand, handing on some of that knowledge uh, to what we do. Uh, Andrew Ambrose, who uh, joined us from from Holland's, um, who's who's been here for a couple of years uh, um, and now. And in fact, actually, he's uh, he's just a bit of bit of info for you. He's he's moving on to uh, to to Purdy's as uh, as the new sales director there, and we couldn't be more pleased and proud of him. Um, he's really uh, really stepping up. So again, that's another great person in the industry you know um moving forward and, and moving up um and then we've got sort of the younger guys as well who are working in amongst this you know guys who've never worked in the industry before guys from the continent that we brought over i've got uh, nelson here in the background who uh, who we sort of semi-imported from brazil who's something of a mauser expert with a uh, with a real passion for it and he's he's now our factory manager and really we couldn't do what we do next door without him he's absolutely dedicated so uh, yeah so it's a good blend of lots of different people and um, you know I think if actually I think if you're in one place for too long sometimes it can you can become a bit stale and things become a bit stale it's it's nice to keep it fresh that was one of my later questions actually you're anticipating <laughs> um, I, I was going to say to you staying in one job for a long time especially at the top there is a danger of treading water or getting complacent and, and dare I say you know as you did stale um, how do you stay motivated and hungry great question uh, a mortgage <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> hungry no. <wife> child. <laughs> yeah no um, I can honestly say that uh, so if you know if I could do this job for free I would have done this is probably well without question this is the proudest um, professional aspect of my life I can't see another opportunity like this coming up to bring back such an incredible name uh, with all these amazing people um, I think you know there's when Rigby came back the market has not grown in the last seven and a half years so Rigby's really has just taken back its portion of the market that would have been there in the 90s and before um, but that did leave a vacuum um, in the last sort of 15-20 years where perhaps um, 
you know, best guns weren't being made. And there's, there's a lot of very, very exciting projects. So, you know, for example, we brought back the rising bike, the, the, the London best, we've got a, a new falling block coming out soon. Um, there's lots of very, very exciting projects, which I can't really talk about going on in, in the room behind me. Um, and, and that's, I think what keeps me really hungry is, um, you know, I, I really want to see Rigby, uh, left in a better state in which we inherited it. And it's very easy to sort of become very complacent and you know, sort of develop some sort of uh, complex where you sort of feel that you are Rigby or you are John Rigby. We're, we're not. We are just custodians for this amazing name and brand and history. And we have a great deal of responsibility to ensure that that continues in a better way in which we inherited it. And that's, that's what keeps us motivated. And it's very interesting to see the path that you've taken since you, you took the mantle of MD on all those years ago, it seems now. Um, you, you've obviously had a, quite a clear strategy about how you were going to in, reintroduce rugby to the shooting public and tempt them to reach into their wallets and buy new products. You know, starting off with the big game and then, then the Highland Stalker and then the uh, Rising Bike Rifles and then the Rising Bike Shotguns. And as you mentioned now, you know, perhaps a falling block and one or two other mystery models that people will, will be interested in seeing in due course. Um, how, how did you come up with that strategy to do things in that order? And um, it's obviously worked for you, but tell us a little bit about the process. As I said, I mean, uh, talking to someone at our Christmas party about it, and as I sort of slightly alluded to before, Every time something's needed to happen here, it's kind of just happened. It's like it's, it sounds sort of corny, but it's like it's almost sort of written in the stars and the planets aligning and things just sort of kind of happen at the right time. And it's, I never really sat down and I had a vision of how it would be, but it wasn't sort of in boxes and very sort of drawn out. It was just sort of this grand vision of how, how Rigby's would look. And then keeping things fluid and as things sort of evolve and at the right time um you know the rising bike for example you know meeting the the right people to be able to machine it at the same time as getting hold of a, a of an original gun at the same time as having some drawings you know all of these things it kind of sort of just happened and um you know it i say i can't i can't really sort of you know i, I often say that we've you know, all we've done here really is awaken a sleeping giant. You know, I think it would be far more, far harder to, to start a completely brand new brand and design. You know, all we've done is sort of build the Rigby's of yesteryear and with the same passion and, and detail. Um, it seems to from be a coincidental perhaps and a happy coincidence that at the time that you've been operating, so much more has become possible. Now, this is partly to do, due to your teaming up with the, uh, the Ellen O group. Um, in terms of the financial muscle and the quantity um, purchases that they can bring to it. Also, improvements in, in machining technology and uh, the opportunity to take, a, as you say, an old Rigby, um, almost reverse engineer it and reconstruct it into a modern iteration of that, that particular gun. Um, th these things weren't possible in Paul Roberts's day, but they were possible in your day, and you've taken full advantage. Absolutely. And, you know, and Paul, Paul would have, uh, you know, he invested a huge personal fortune into bringing the company back. You know, I think when he took it on in 82, it was, you know, it was in a similar sort of state to when we took it on. And, um, you know, Paul, Paul did that almost entirely out of his own pocket, which is pretty incredible. Um, you know, we're, we're very blessed that we are owned and part of a large group, um, as many other gun makers are, but our real strength is that we're owned by a gun making group. So they really understand gun making and the whole passion and, uh, and ethos that goes into it. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, as, as I say, it's, it, it, your luck is sort of overused, but I don't know what the term is. It just feels like it's sort of the whole thing's on rails. It kind of, you know, when something needs to happen, it, it just sort of happens. And, um, you know, and it's it's all built off one the name, of course, and two the amazing people that work at this shop. It's, it's just you know we're in the middle of a lockdown and we've been living here for five weeks. You know, and half the team are here with me, and it's just a non-issue them being here. They, and people really believe in what we've created and they want to see it carry on. And that's that's the that's the big secret, I think. That's that's going to be an interesting story to write into the history of Rigby twenty years from now when people are reminiscing about this particular period in the way that historians have on past periods. But I want to move away a little bit from some of the nuts and bolts stuff. Um, 
and, and just ask you about you know yourself and the way that you run a company now, having learned you know organically. What, how would you describe your personal management style? Um, I th I've always found sort of um, you know leading or whatever you want to call it sort of comes quite naturally. I've sort of felt very comfortable with it, and I love being part of a team, and I really enjoy leading a team. Um, some great advice I've received from Robert Hiscox once, uh, who was a client at Jeb Robertson Son. It was right at the beginning uh, of, of this. And I've always tried to listen to those. If, you, if you've got a successful older guy or lady, for that matter, um, who get, gives advice, you know, listen, because it's, it's coming from a good place. And right at the beginning, uh, he said to me, he's, congratulations, do not fall foul of cock sparrow syndrome. I said, what's that? And you know, of course, we all know what a cock sparrow is. He lives in a hedge. And uh, cock sparrow syndrome is where you, you sort of feel sort of quite sort of important and you don't allow anyone else who could potentially be a threat to, to come around you. He said, the reason, and this is Robert again, the reason he was able to build such a great uh, business is he always hired people who were better than him. And uh, something I always remembered, and I've, I've always tried to do two things. One is to hire great people um you know brilliant people uh, but also a bit of the sort of uh, nelson touch you know to to inspire all of those people to feel like sort of mini mini sort of ceos i suppose so um whilst we all follow one person in one direction everybody is inspired to make a decision so i try and sort of tell the guys to you know i'd rather you make a decision and it's the wrong decision and we learn from it than to take no decision at all but it means that you're because I, you know i'm only one person it means i can then sort of make lots of mini mini versions of me all pushing in the same sort of direction and yeah whilst we don't always get it get it right most of the time we do and uh it's um yeah it seems it seems seem, seems seems to work very well you know we're a team now of 24 people and you know, everyone's pushing hard what gives you pleasure away from the office and how do you make time for it um it's difficult with the commute so i, I you know i live in uh, on the sussex hampshire border with my uh, beautiful wife katie and our, our lovely daughter rose um and uh i don't you know unfortunately i don't get to see as much of them as i would like but uh you know, I'm glad that we can live in an amazing part of the country. Uh, it does mean a fair bit of commuting uh, to and from London each day. But uh, you know, we enjoy uh, we do lots of different things. You know, hunting, shooting, fishing, of course. Uh, rose gardening, that's one of my real passions. Uh, we're actually in the process of, uh, of renovating a new house at the moment, which um, looks like, uh, I think as Simon described, Simon Barr described it yesterday, a scene from Black Hawk Down with sort of uh, piles of rubble and other stuff. Um, so but once that's finished, we'll, we'll have our lovely new rose garden in there. Um, you know, uh, walks, we live close to a beautiful trout fishing lake. I uh, came to stay with you last year, I think it was Dig, and you know, caught some trout on your lovely little river at the end of the garden. I suppose just enjoying the quieter things in life. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm very lucky, there's uh, several members of the team here, to do a lot of travelling for, for work. So we spend a lot of time in America and all over the world. Um, so actually, when it comes to downtime, I'm quite sort of happy just walking the dog and just putting my feet up and tending to the garden. It's uh, <laughs> very, very different than, than, than London life. Absolutely. What do you shoot with? Uh, depending on what, I, what, I, what I'm shoot, uh, shooting. So uh, pheasant shooting, rough shooting things. Um, I'll use one of the, the rigbies that we have here. Um, I've also got our grandfather's Charles Boswell. Uh, which I can't hit a barn door with, but it's sort of rather nice to take it out and, and blow a few cobwebs through it at some, you know, at some time of the year. Um, uh, I also shoot a 16 bore um, over and under for, you know, for, for, for those wet days where you perhaps you don't want to take out something from the museum. And then for, for deer stalking, either a sort of 275 Highland Stalker or, or something a little bit more um, robust, shall we say, for when the, when the weather's bad. And, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of people often say, well, you should only use a rig you are the man from Rigby's and you know, perhaps they've got a point. But uh, I think if you if you if if you use and try diff lots of different things, it can only make your gun making better because um, you know, Rigby a hundred years ago did was not the oracle of everything and I'm sure he would listen and test things and try and develop ideas and I think that's that's really important. And what kind of shooting do you enjoy most? 
Uh, definitely with the rifle more so than anything. Uh, so that was Dad's real passion, uh, deer stalking. So, you know, um, we've got a fantastic um, pro lease near our house where we hunt some fabulous old roebucks every year. Uh, you know, up in Scotland, we've got a house up there. So we get up in the, in the, in the amongst the stags later in the year. And then with the, the shotgun, I suppose my sort of sh shooting is changing where I've sort of moving more away from the, the big, you know, sort of more sort of corporate days. So actually really enjoying sort of rough shooting. Uh, when I say rough shooting, I'm talking sort of like, you know, our local village syndicate where we shoot sort of 50, 60 birds. There's more guns than there are beaters um you know it's everyone has a sort of you know drink at 11 z's and pack of unruly spaniels and you know you shoot a woodcock and a few few pigeons and a few sort of uh pheasants that have probably been sort of teased over from from the neighboring estates you know and it's it, that, that's the more the sort of thing that i've been enjoying um and, and i actually i joined a syndicate last year down on the some marshland uh down there sort of pulver way and it was fantastic because you go out and we a team of eight guns we'd shoot 30 birds of a day but they would be you know widgeon teal a pigeon a woodcock three snipe you know a hare you know it, it was just really fantastic stuff and uh, I, th I think that's probably more towards what where i'm sort of headed with my shooting moving forward I, I tend to get much more sort of pleasure from that than i do going through the motions of you know of a formal day yeah no it's interesting it's quite a common story it's, it's similar to, to myself i'm i'm, I'm very but back in Shropshire now and shooting far, far more uh, scratch days and a lot more rough shooting and our little syndicate averages sort of 30 to 80 birds on a very, very similar, um, similar kind of operation. And lots of game keeping to do in the meantime. Um, yes. Now, if you just look back on where you are at the moment, from your relatively young age, it would make probably more sense to ask this to an old timer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So. Uh, Having been through so much so so soon, what would thirty-one year old Mark tell twenty-five year old Mark when he was starting out, if that were possible? Um, oh, that's a, I think that is an absolutely brilliant question. Uh, I, to stop minding, that would be my advice. Stop to minding. stop minding, you cannot possibly please everybody, and to you know there were. I remember. I remember when I started and perhaps it, I think it's probably actually really important in those sort of formative years at Rigby's of being sort of absolutely terrified of what people would think of a 25 year old kid running this company. I don't know. Nick Holt. I remember sort of telling Nick Holt and being terribly nervous and it was born out of this massive respect for I had and continued to have for all of these people that they would think I was something of a joke, but you know, that all of them, every single one of the people in the industry were, very very supportive and um you know helped out where they could and things and you know sort of seen it grow from there so i think you know, I would, my advice would to my younger self would be to you know don't don't worry so much you know just focus on what you can do and the rest will sort itself out and that's just something that comes with maturity and uh, and time and i'm sure you know if i'm still here which i hope i will be at 40 there'll be a different outlook to to what i have now um so yeah just you know focus on what you can do and enjoy and the, the wider question about the health of the gun trade in the UK at the moment and the challenges facing it, how do you see the um, state of play as we stand today with the various challenges that are facing you as gun makers and us as shooting people? And um, what do you think the next five or six years are going to bring in terms of challenges that we're going to need to face down? I think, uh, I think we, you know, we always need a little bit more unity. I remember that we're, we should all be fighting, uh, you know, as a single unit and not amongst each other. Um, you know, I think this whole sort of lead situation is a classic example of that. Um, and trying to, uh, yeah, just sort of just unify a little bit more. I think, um, as I said earlier, we have, you know, there's a massive responsibility for, for, for people running and working at companies like, Holland, Purdy, Boss, Wesley, Rigby, you know, all of these names, you know, Dixons, you name it. There is a, there's a lot, of, lot of history there. It's part of the sort of fabric of British shooting life. And uh, we need to probably sort of remember that a little bit more rather than sort of in, being, being individuals um, and ensuring that, that, that this is there for our children and our, our grandchildren in, in, you know, in, in the best way possible. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think, Sometimes, though, we also sort of tend to put ourselves down a little bit too much in the industry. I think it's a pretty amazing 
group of people in this country uh, who, who, who build these things. And it's like, uh, you know, Ed Workman talks about, he's going to write a book one day, you know, you couldn't make it up because it's like something out of a sort of Monty Python sketch. Some of the things that you hear of how these things come about, your guns are being built, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that it's sort of still, uh, still, still, still working as well as it is. And we, and we need to remember, remember that not, you know, look at the glass half full and not half empty all the time. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, you know, just keep, keep the positivity up. Thank you. And um, finally, this is, this is bringing us to the end, but um, I'm going to ask this to everybody that I interview. Um, what figure in the gun trade do you think we should interview next and why? Oh, well, there's so many. Hmm. Paul Roberts, of course, I'm going to say that because I'm totally biased. I mean, he's really seen it from the 50s. He's in it for sort of getting on for 70 years. Um, there aren't many people alive who, who've seen so much. I think someone like, uh, someone like Paul would be fantastic. Um, uh, someone like Trigger, Wesley Richards, I've always massively looked up to, to Trigger and what they do there. I think they really set, set the benchmark of of a modern British gun making company. Uh, I think that would be a fascinating insight. Um, you know, there's, there's one or two and, 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 you know, don't, let's not exclude the ladies, you know, people like Patricia, you know, who was so important here. I know she would, uh, she'd love to talk to you guys and, uh, you know, talk, talking to people from all backgrounds and, you know, uh, and all, all, all sort of viewpoints, I suppose. Mark, that's been fascinating. Thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, busy day. And, um, your important work so i'll let you go back to have some lunch with the chaps in the workshop and i wish you all you for your continued lockdown no thank you very much as i'll just finish up on the fact that uh, the rigby the rigby gun makers uh, they they make better guns than they do uh, sort of haircuts um it's sort of, some people have commented on my sort of short back and sides it's uh <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. let them loose with a, with a set of trimmers <laughs> i think a lot of us are going to come out of this period with some interesting haircuts Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll let you get to it. Thank you very much for your time, Digby. Thank you, Mark.